Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman is a podcast on directing for anybody that's quite simply ever watched anything. Pete converses with a wide range of fellow directors, writers, actors, showrunners, producers, executives, and more on a journey to determine just what makes a good director and why we'll always need stories. The Director is Pete Chapman's digital studio, built on the pillars of craftsmanship that ensure a unique vision. I'm talking about story, innovation, perspective. Learn more about The Director, and better yet, get your official director's chair wear by visiting www.drctr.video. That's drctr.video. All right, what's up, people? Welcome to episode... 27 of Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. And I apologize, we are a little late this week. Normally we would have dropped by now. I'm recording this episode on uh, Wednesday, April 28th, and we're gonna turn it around real quick in the TMI department, but y'all might appreciate it. We use a new platform to record the podcast called Riverside.fm. And it's dope because what it does is it'll tap into the video and audio of the guest. It'll access their computer, I guess, and pull from whatever they record, audio and video, and then house that in a cloud. And then we're able to take that and construct the interview. And what we used to do was uh, do it via Zoom, but that meant that we were kind of tethered to the Zoom format and we couldn't necessarily show both videos at one time on one screen. And Tristan and I think that that'll be a more interesting delivery system for you all to kind of see me and the guests or however many people we have on the show interacting at the same time. So in trying to update my iMac from 2017, I ended up having an issue with the operating system. I don't advise anyone to do what I used to do, which was not updated for like five years almost. And um, when I updated it, it became a big issue. I almost lost all my media. I hadn't done a time machine backup since August of 2020. And I was a, a fucking asshole. And I was about to, I would have fired myself if I could, but I couldn't, so I just had to eat it. And all that's resolved now though. I have a new iMac, I'm recording from that. I ended up with a new MacBook Air because I got to do a little shooting out of town and I needed that to help with my prep. And that's the backstory. But anyway, in looking at all the new, all the files on my computer, I was able to get everything. I came across a document that I had created back in 2011 for an event that I did with Anthony Artists who I co-hosted the Double Down Film Show podcast with from 2009 to 2011. We did an event called Indie Boot Camp, Indie Film Boot Camp, and that was in New York City. It was a two-day event. It was Anthony, it was myself, and it was Benjamin R. Harrison. Anthony talked more about the production and equipment aspect of things. For indie filmmakers, I talked about the psychology and technique of directing, and Benjamin R. Harrison talked about music videos, how to make, if I remember correctly, it was how to make, you know, a low budget video look like a million dollars. And that was something that he was very, very good at doing. And so anyway, I found this uh, PowerPoint and I said, well, damn, it's 10 years later. Let me go through this PowerPoint. Let me give y'all another craft episode. But I said, let me just bring y'all the psychology and technique of directing seminar and see what holds up from 2011 to 2021. So I'm gonna talk through it and give a little commentary as we go through, if I notice anything that I have a new opinion on and we'll see what we got. So here we go. The psychology and technique of directing. Roll sound speed. The interview, take one. For those who are watching on video, I apologize if my eye lines are crazy, but I'm really trying to read this while also uh, maintaining my eye contact with, with my camera here for my YouTube viewers out there. But here we go. So the psychology and technique of directing. What's inside? You know the difference between close-ups and tracking shots. You're familiar with who should be doing what on your set. Well, what do you do when personalities clash, time is running out, and you suddenly realize that you weren't as prepared as you thought? You remember what you're about to learn. 
I still co-sign that. And, and what I'm digging here is that even then I was beginning to, I guess, see that it's not about what you know how to do artistically. It's about how you manage yourself. And I think that's where the title comes from, the psychology and technique of directing. So you want to be a director. That's slide number two. Slide number three, why? And that's a question that I think you have to pose to yourself as a director, whether you're beginning, whether you're emerging, whether you're in it now, you can lose track of what most excited you about being a storyteller. And in that particular capacity, being a director who is really in charge of protecting the story and elevating that story for the audience, as Carl Seaton talked about in uh, last week's episode. And a uh, shout out to Carl because that snowfall finale was popping. Everybody was lighting up Twitter and Instagram about it. And he did an amazing job with those two final episodes. So shout out to that brother and for sharing that that adage about viewing himself as, as the protector of the story for the audience. He's the first audience member as a director. But why do you want to be a director? You're going to need to figure that out because this can be a very long journey before you ever get in the director's chair in a paid position. And it's going to be important that you have a reason to tell the stories that you want to tell. The types of directors. I have one type. <laughs> and in this document, uh, I have a picture of, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the, uh, the type first. There are five types. Type A, I write my own action, aka it's all about the camera. And I have a picture of Michael Bay. Type B, how did you feel about that take? AKA the actor's director. And I have a picture of Mr. Spike Lee. Type C, great performance, but let's do one more for the CGI body we're going to composite on top of you in post. AKA the thespian techie. I think in that one, I had a picture of David Fincher, probably because he had just done maybe something like Benjamin Buttons or something, if I if I can connect the dots of what I'm saying here back in 2011. Type D, go there, hit your mark, say your line, aka actors are cattle. And I don't know if that is a thing that's become Hollywood legend or paraphrasing, but folks have said that that was Hitchcock's perspective. And then I have type E, <clears throat> Where's my latte? And tell my dad thanks for the job, a.k.a. about 90 percent of the industry. And again, I asked that question, who will you be on this slide? I found in the 10 years since this seminar that. I'm all of these in some degree, right? There is a very intricate stunt sequence that I did in episode eight of season three of you coming up later this year, where it was, I, it was, I wrote my own action. There were things in the script that as I started considering how I wanted to capture the action, I was adding beats. I was adding things that were not written. I was adding things that were written to be off screen, to be on. And that was because as I began to write my action and construct it, I saw an opportunity to actually elevate this beautiful scenario that I've been given. I kind of lean into being an actor's director, but I will say on a lot of TV, I may not get that opportunity because many times I'm dealing with something that is already already well understood. And I'm more trying to make sure we get the best out of something that's been kind of created as far as the great performance but let's do one more cgi body etc i've had to do that a few times in my silicon uh valley episode we had to do a head replacement on chris Diamantopoulos as russ hanneman as he rode the motorcycle through cuddyback lake in the desert i don't feel in line with the actors are cattle perspective, but I will say there are some times where you do wish that, you know, you could get folks to just kind of do his simple mark because there's a lot of choreography tethered to that particular mark that begins to unravel the sweater if you pull at it. And that's more so in intricate kind of scenes where you have a lot of blocking, a lot of people and someone going to another side of the room or moving in a way that's off axis can end up creating 
two more setups. And, and a, a lot of times you just, you, you, you want to avoid that. And yes, of course, uh, there is a lot of nepotism in this industry, but think about which type you are and maybe where you might enhance your skill set and start carving that out and building it into, you know, making yourself a more well-rounded director. Because to, in these days, every scenario comes up. So demands on directors. Directors have to have all the answers. All creative decisions flow through you. Directors have to remain calm despite the fact that you won't be. Filmmaking is about controlled exploration and command of the material. So managing your nerves is important. And directors must encourage collaboration. Your crew is better at their jobs than you could ever be. You want them to perform as you would if you could. And that is the truth. I, I'm no, I've shot things, I've camera opt on branded content, but I am not a DP. So I'm trying to use, you know, the talents and invigorate the talents of the people I collaborate with to do what I'm thinking, but then elevate it. And so collaboration is essential. If you want to work by yourself, go be a painter. Other than that, make sure that you know how to bring out the best in people and not tamp down on creativity. The five stages of directing, development, pre-production, production, post-production, post exhibition slash distribution. In development, how early you get involved will vary, but this is where you are in your most unencumbered creative space. Your brainstorming and the possibilities are endless. During development, you will work every possible angle of the story, you will determine all the questions you have about the material. You will find the answers you need, ensuring that you are able to live up to the demands on directors that we just went through, which were having all the answers, remaining calm, and creating an environment of collaboration. This is something that 10 years later, I will say spot fucking on. When I get a script for a TV show, when I get a script for a feature film, as I'm getting a few more now, as I'm looking to get back into that world. Everything for me is about taking it in as an audience and then as an audience member, asking every, the, the simple questions or the big questions to ensure that I understand what's going on. I want to make sure that I've asked everything possible, whether I'm writing it or I'm directing it, so I can, as a writer, answer it or as a director, pose it. And the episode writer in TV or the showrunner will often be able to put me at ease with a simple answer, or sometimes we will collaboratively find an answer that does what we need it to do to ensure that the story is operating on all cylinders. The other thing is you learn that there are different things within your toolkit as a type of director, going back to those five types, that you can call upon to make a story element work. So sometimes, you know, it's holding a look, having an actor hold a look or lock eyes with someone and doing a slow push. You know that that will communicate everything about a moment that might not be translatable on a page, but you know that that will make sure the audience feels it. Or sometimes it might be, you know, finding the right conversation or prompt or adjustment for an actor to make sure the nuance of a moment is communicated. But all of these things are governed by what you're beginning to question in development. You'll want to maximize your development by doing these five, these four things, pardon me. Becoming the dramaturg, story is your only concern, by establishing yourself as the authority on the material, by developing your visual style, but only after you achieved, you've achieved the above, and then by searching for visual references for all of your key teammates. Now, the third and fourth point there, developing your visual style, but only after you've achieved the above and searching for visual references for all of your key teammates is really specific to feature filmmaking. The visual style for a television show, unless you're doing a pilot, has already been determined. Visual references for your key teammates not really something you're going to find yourself doing often unless you have an episode with something, as I always say, very unique to it that offers you an opportunity to introduce something new. 
And going back to the you episode I mentioned, I worked with a storyboard artist to ensure that what I envisioned is what we'd be able to capture because it was it, it, it does not exist in any of the other episodes, I guess, 30 to date once the season drops. It'll be its own unique thing. But all of this is in the interest of becoming the authority over the material because you're going to be the one answering questions and you're going to be the one guiding departments. As far as the guiding principles of development, here are the kind of wrap up bullet points that I offer, considering that this is called the psychology and technique of directing. For stage one development, the guiding principles are for the psychology, you will get everything that you want. Don't get used to it. The technique, you'll take advantage of this stage by wringing out every ounce of analysis that you can. You'll thank yourself later. FYI, most of your projects will stay here. It's called development hell for a reason. Moving on into stage two, pre-production, that's where you've exited development hell and your team is growing. You're continuing to develop your authority over the material while starting to hire the creative personnel who will challenge everything you've decided. It's time to ensure that the plan you outlined during development will be achieved. During pre-production, you will break down the script, you will cast talent, you will finalize the color palette and visual references for key teammates, you will cast your DP, production designer, AD, UPM, line producer, and more. You will finalize your approach on how scenes will be covered as far as shots, lenses, camera movement, and you will keep an eye out for weak links. I have a quote here from Steve Buscemi where he says, when I was in pre-production for Trees Lounge, I was hearing the cinematographer talking with the production designer about colors and this and that and feeling like I was losing control. And I am I think that was probably his first feature. I don't know if he did another uh, feature film, but I have that quote included on this slide because I think it's important to, again, during development, begin to solidify a point of view in as many different categories uh, as possible, really in every category that in every bit of creativity that is available for you in your director's toolkit. So you don't have that happen to you. You don't start talking to a DP and because you haven't considered lenses and 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 framing and, and filtration, now everything they say sounds awesome because you haven't given it a thought. And it's not that you have to be a DP, but these are things that you can think about in the same way that you may not be an architect, but you can say, I need three bedrooms. You know, I like to have built in uh, shelves. I want to walk in closet. Like I'm of the opinion that you have to, and you can do the same thing as a director. You can say, I want it to be cooler. I'm, I think it's, I've watched a bunch of films and I think this is something that would be more blue than brown. I think we're on the you know lower end of, of the Kelvin spectrum, if you know the technical terms, right? I think that we're going to work on long lenses and have shallow depth of field for the whole thing to really make the rest of the world fall off for this project or this show or this film or this web series, right? These are all the things that you've developed in development. And now again, you're going to begin to have questioned and challenged by the people that you brought on for that very reason. So you'll break down the script in pre-production. What does the character want? What does the character get? You will look for emotional changes of each character in every scene. I have a script page in here from my feature where I'm kind of going through demarking where the upbeats are, where the downbeats are, where the beat changes are. This is probably all for another show, but the units of every scene for a character are the energy levels at which they enter and end, if that makes sense. So if I start on an upbeat and I'm happy and I'm expecting something to go my way, well, the minute that it does not, that's a beat. My expectations have not been met. Now that's a shift. And then what happens over the, it does, does the scene continue beyond that? If it ends, now we've identified the major moment. How does that major moment contribute to what happens throughout the entire act or the sequence? All of these things are the, the units of, of where your job begins because when you identify 
those units, you then know that's where the camera push goes or, you know, we want that person in red because we need to have them stand out for a particular reason. I think you could go through as a good exercise things that you really enjoy and do a little bit of a Monday morning quarterback reverse engineering to consider, well, why did they do that? Why is the young girl in the red dress in uh, Schindler's List? What, what answers can you come up for yourself? And the more that you question, going back also to that fundamental aspect of the development process, the more that you question, the more that you will begin to understand what's at play and also begin to have answers because the, you'll have answered so many questions over a long enough timeline that then you can work much quicker. And, that, and that's very much over the past 10 years I found to be a key to directing television. In stage two of pre-production, you will also cast your talent. The work you did breaking down the script into beats is priceless. You've pinpointed the detailed architecture of each character in every scene, and you're able to engage in authoritative conversations with talent. It's now time to explore. You can iron out the kinks of the outline you created in development, but allow yourself to discover levels of humanity that you alone couldn't possibly find. Let the actors help you. Here's how you'll do it. You'll hire a casting director to facilitate the process. You will choose sides that will allow you to accurately judge the appropriate talent level of potential cast. You'll be considerate of the actor's process and how ineffective auditions really are. You'll ask if they have questions on the character because they may surprise you with what they say. If you like someone, perhaps you put them through the motions to see if they take direction well. And you won't waste their time or yours, but you'll be a human being. You won't rush them through or I've never been a fan of saying thank you four words in if I'm seeing that somebody's not right. I just want to I don't want them to feel like shit when they leave. That's a personal uh, preference. In pre-production, you'll be working on your color palette and visual preferences. Sets are built. Productions are designed. Graphics and composites are created out of thin air. Your direction is key. How will you do it? You will analyze each character's reality and create a world full of details that reflect your decisions. You'll clip photos, take pictures, watch movies, visit museums, scour the web for references. You'll encourage the input of your key crew only after you've outlined your thoughts to them. I call that the willing to be convinced approach. And by that, I mean, I try and answer every question as if I were every department head so I have a direction for the project to go, but the willing to be convinced approach is knowing that the reality of any creative process is someone will see something in a story that I didn't. They will be sparked by ideas that I was not. And oftentimes they will elevate something about the story that perhaps I missed because I can't connect to it in every level. So the willing to be convinced approach is important in my mind because it allows other people to build upon this thing that you are um, ushering to the audience and trying to protect. Lastly, you'll add each and every reference of any sort to your director's notebook. You are likely to forget what you decided and why. Now, 10 years later, this is an iPad, but the organization remains the same. I never let my iPad down. I never put it down while I'm on set or in prep or just working on a project and around the people with whom I'm working because at any moment I have in that iPad something that can answer a question with much more clarity than a verbal answer might do. And clarity is key to make sure that we're all working efficiently and using our time and not going down the wrong road because something was a little bit unclear. Casting crew. Don't hire anyone that you can't see yourself having a productive relationship with. You don't have to like them, but you must avoid unnecessary conflict in order to encourage an environment of collaboration. It's better to have someone with less talent and more commitment on your project than an all-star award-winning crew member who could care less about this jewel you've poured your heart into. How will you do it? You'll be aware of the adversarial relationships and include those folks in the interview process. DP, 
to producer, DP and production design, AD and everyone. By that, I mean DP and producer often can go head to head because one wants to keep the budget down. The other wants as many toys as possible to tell the story in the most visual way possible. DP and production design, DPs hate white sets, hate white cars, hate white walls. Production design might be building this particularly around white walls, or there can often just be a clash between what works for the story for the production designer and then what works in a technical sense for the DP. AD and everyone, I jokingly write that because they're always telling somebody they got no time and we need it done now. And the best ADs do it with, with, with humor and, 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 and they're very adept and and great at managing people's uh, emotions in what's a very challenging em environment. But you wanna make sure that you don't have people in these positions who are gonna clash because they can't, their jobs just by definition mean that they're gonna be in a contentious a position at times and don't have that on your set. Be honest about how you want your set to run and whether or not this person that you might hire fits into that mold. Remember that a reel is not a reference. Call at least three people that have worked with this person. A reel means nothing. If you're looking, and I keep finding, I, I feel like I keep talking about uh, cinematographers here, but it seems to be the easiest reference point. A cinematographer's reel could look very beautiful, but it could also be shots that were designed to be on their reel that didn't fit the scene. Or, you know, they could be, there's a whole host of, of reasons why what you're watching is out of context from what would have worked for the story. And so you want to make sure that you get at least three people to give you the lowdown on on what it was like to work with that person, because that's what can really help you ascertain whether or not they're going to be a good fit. And that goes for every production head that you're going to work with. And after you've done all the above, now you can relax because there are plenty of folks you don't need to be involved with hiring. Your UPM and line producers will handle the rest of that. You're just concerned with the department heads and their hiring during pre-production. In pre-production, you will work out your scene coverage, your shots, your lenses, your camera movement. It's called the language of cinema for a reason. The way you use these tools directs your audience to feel a certain way, whether it's conscious or subconsciously. So master your toolbox. Standard shots include establishing shot, wide shot, full shot, close up, medium close up, extreme close up, over the shoulder. 50-50s. Camera lens movements include tracking, panning, zooming, dollying, tilting, racking. I have gravy shots here, and that's something where you're really going, you know, maybe you're doing a zolly or maybe you're doing something that, you know, a, a, a steady cam shot where they step off the crane and you just get a continuous oneer. but you need to be aware of what those available shots are for you. You'll Figure out your coverage and your lenses and your camera movements by asking your question, asking yourself questions like, what is the overall intent in the scene? What is the tone? What are you revealing? Who has the power and does that dynamic change within the scene? I've noted here too that uh, you will apply Pete Chapman's patent pending most important moment theory. And the idea behind that is when you're in a crunch for time and you have 30 minutes to get, you know, a page and a half done and you can't cover it in all the ways that you envisioned, if you know what the most important moment is in your scene, you can pick the one or two shots that tell the story and ensure that while maybe not having all the, you know, sauce and gravy that you wanted to put on it, your scene, the core of your scene will still be communicated to your audience and they'll never know that you wanted to, you know, get all these different tracking shots or whatever. It's now a one -er with a with a close up at, on a final moment or on that most important moment and your scene works 100%. So making sure you've noted what that moment is is the is really your insurance on on being a good director. Rehearsals. 
These are not a guarantee that you will have, but if you have the budget to do so, this is where you will save time and money as you begin to solidify what will happen on set. Take advantage of this opportunity. Rehearse, rehearse, rehearse. Clearly, as a reminder, this is really focused on indie filmmaking as I opened this up from 10 years ago, but many of these things remain true. Rehearsing in the indie film world is not given because you probably just have enough money to pay them to act and perform in the final product and you don't have you you make a decision oftentimes not to budget for rehearsal because you want to put the money elsewhere but that means you have to be even more sharp on what you want and you have to be very clear on how you use your audition so you know or if they're not auditioning and you're just having phone calls or in a pre-covid world pre-zoom world actually having coffee or a drink you know that time is where you're kind of rehearsing because you're making sure that there's clarity in what you're going for in the project and from the character. Pre-production guiding principles. The psychology of pre-production is you will get most of what you want, but don't get used to this either. Cast, crew, and locations are the areas where you'll have to start recalibrating your vision for the film. The technique during pre-production Start prepping yourself for the reality of production. The movie that you shoot is not going to be a mirror image of the movie that you wrote. That's the way it is. Stage three, production. Trench warfare. I'm looking at the photo on this slide. I got camo on. And I, I guess I was, that was the start of my camo phase because I've been wearing military hats probably since. But production is trench warfare. Everything you've planned is taking longer than anticipated. Despite your best efforts, you've hired a few head cases <laughs> and you're finding that you aren't as confident as you were when it was just a brainstorm in development and you weren't locked into every decision by time, money, and 50 people's silent criticism. Nevertheless, every day you will do your best to protect the creative approach that you outlined in development. During this stage, you will direct your crew, direct your talent, Adhere to Anthony Q. Artis's dictum, the only thing that matters is what's in your heart and what's on the monitor. I like that. You will make the day and you will maintain a support system for yourself. I have two quotes here that I hope inspire you as you move through your production phases. One from Ilya Kazan, a good director is not sure when he gets on the set what he's going to do. And from Mr. Spike Lee, a lot of times you get credit for stuff in your movies that you didn't intend to be there. So I think that speaks to the happy accidents that happen on set. I think it speaks to the fact that we don't have it all figured out, but it also speaks to the buck, not the buck stopping with you when the audience watch, watches the film. They're not going to say that set is whack or that actor had a whack performance. They're going to say that director didn't do a, a good job with the film. And so for all the things that you get love for, just know that you don't get hate for. And that's why you work your ass off in development to ensure that there are no holes in your idea and your execution complements the themes of the story. Hi, it's Aya Cash and you are listening to Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman. Transitions, A Director's Journey and Motivational Handbook is Pete Chapman's upcoming book from Michael Weezy Productions. What started in 1993 has been a marathon of persistence and creative pivots, transitioning from indie filmmaker to teaching at NYU's acclaimed film school, to running a production company, to directing television and commercials, and ultimately eyeing a return to the feature films that gave him a start. A mixture of how-to, self-help, and inspiration, this book is for any person targeting a successful career in the creative arts. Transitions, a director's journey and motivational handbook is coming soon. On our next slide here, during production, you'll direct crew. By this point, your technical comrades know exactly what you want to achieve with the look and feel of the film. They are ready to use their skills in the service of the story and in support of your vision. It's still your job to 
Keep everyone moving toward the same goal because as chaos arises, and it definitely will, the director is responsible for setting the tone for the entire set. If you do this right, it frees you up to focus your attention on the most important part. Here's how you will do it. You'll utilize commander's intent. You'll be clear and concise about what you want your collaborators to achieve. You'll learn to speak their language. You'll encourage the collaborative environment that will allow your department heads to make your film better and you'll intervene when you need to. So commander's intent was something that I learned in making our documentary about the first black tank battalion in World War II, the 761st Black Panther Tank Battalion. And commander's intent is this idea that in battle, you can't necessarily say you will run down, you will run into the field, you will receive enemy fire to the tally of 20 bullets that you'll roll into a trench to avoid, then you will get up and sprint and take the hill. Like no one knows what will come once the battle begins. So commander's intent is what is the actual mission? The mission is to take that hill over there half a mile away. And by any fucking means necessary, you're gonna make it happen. And that is very much what you're doing as a director. Your commander's intent is to capture the scene that you developed, I mean, that was written or that you wrote and that you figured out what needed to happen on screen during development and you refine that during prep. Now that you're shooting, your job is to make sure you make that happen. Whether you've got a a challenging personality or you're running out of time or you have a technical issue with the equipment or the location owner told you they could turn off all the refrigerators and now they can't, you got to figure it out. And that's what commander's intent is. And that's where you see a lot of people who want to direct and go through the uh, trials of directing come out on the other end, on the other side of the trench and, and become editors because it's not an easy job. I have you learn to speak their language, the language of your collaborators. Look, it's great if you can if you can speak musically to your composer. It's great if you can speak in uh, focal length with your DP. It's great if you can get into a, a Freudian debate with your actor. But at the end of the day, what you're really responsible for is communicating emotionally, communicating with clarity what emotionally is happening on screen, within a scene, underneath the scene, what the subtext might be, what we want to lean into versus what we want to lean away from. If you're able to do that clearly, you can talk to any department head on your project and they'll be able to translate what you're telling them into musical notes, into colors, into lenses. So if you think about it like that, the job is actually somewhat easy, but it requires you to have emotional intelligence and clarity of thought in that department. Directing talent. The most important work that you will do as a director will be guiding your cast toward delivering your version of truth in a way that best uses their talents. No two actors are alike. They have different tendencies, triggers, and responses to your approach. Your primary job is to find the right path to achieve your vision. Actors are putting everything on the line for you. Take after vulnerable take and deserve this attention. If you are unhappy with a performance, it's probably because you didn't break down the script with enough detail or you didn't let casting do the work for you or you don't know how to communicate how to make an adjustment. How will you direct talent? You'll follow the compass of your beat breakdown. You'll utilize descriptive adjectives. There is a book I've mentioned on the podcast called The Actor's Thesaurus. I recommend you pick that up. You will use motivation-driven direction, not result-driven direction. So you won't say, I need you to be more mad. You would come from an angle of the condescend condescension is a trigger for you in this scene. I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of freestyling right here, but those are different directions. One is putting you into the emotional thing that's happening and then kind of energizing the performance of the talent versus saying, end up here. And that, that's just, that's not a, that's a destination, not a roadmap. 
And I think we're in the, in the land of roadmaps. I was also, I'm reminded now, I was on a Facebook, on an Instagram live during a lunch break last week on All Rise, where I was answering a question from an actor saying, you know, the script is not the solution, it's the equation. And if we remember that we're doing the math or subtraction or division or multiplication with the script in a collaborative way with all stakeholders involved, that's where we end up with the answer, which is the edited TV show or film. In directing talent, continuing that breakdown, you will be honest when things are not working. You have to, you can't move on if it doesn't work. You will also be a champion when things are. Don't just be the person who has negative shit to say. If the take was good, let them know. If they made an adjustment that you didn't ask for, acknowledge it because you're watching. It lets people know you're paying attention to the creative decisions that they're making. In the same way that you want somebody to be like, oh man, that, that transition was dope between those scenes or that montage, that was crazy. Well, how about that production design? You know, how about that little pivot in blocking? How about that editing choice to move scene three to scene, between scene 14 and 15? You know, let people know you're watching because then they're going to want to give you more because they know that you're clocking it. The only thing that matters is what's in your heart and what's on the monitor. That's Anthony Artis's dictum on this slide. I just have enough said. How will you adhere to that? You just stay true to it and treat it like scripture. And remember, when the when the day is getting away from you, when if it's cold outside, if you're tired, at the end of the day, what's on the monitor is going to be what people interface with, what people experience. And it's up to you to protect that and make sure that they get the best version of this show. Making the day. Getting the day's scheduled scenes in the can is the number one job of the director, at least in the eyes of the producer. No serious director is against making the day, but there isn't a film in the history of the world that did not go off schedule. This is a battle that a smart director treats like a war when the time is right. How will you make the day? You will move quickly and efficiently through all of the shots and setups that you solidified during the development and pre-production stages, or that you figured out when you got on set, like Eli Kazan. Knowing this, Murphy's Law will arise, but you will survive. How will you not make the day? There may come a time where you will make the choice to not move on from a pivotal scene unless you can comfortably say we've got it. You'll protect the story at all costs, but you'll use this card wisely. And you'll know that if you push a scene, you know, an hour, 90 minutes past what you had it scheduled for, then maybe another scene during the day is going to have to be simplified. Or maybe another scene down the line might have to get booted. But it's all driven by what is most important for the story. And that's how you'll make the day or not. The final bit here is during production, you'll maintain a support system for yourself. I have a picture here of a beautiful island, very green and blue water. Looks like it might be in the Philippines. You are this island. It looks sexy and it's on many a bucket list, but most people never follow through and take that deserted island vacation. That island represents your commitment to being a director. You're about to complete stage three of the process, production, but you're beginning to realize that it's lonely at the top. The responsibility is incredible and your self-confidence occasionally withers. You can't do this alone. How will you maintain a support system for yourself? You'll acknowledge that you will have to direct yourself to stay focused and confident. You'll realize the importance of the relationship with your script supervisor, and hopefully you'll confide in your friends and family about what's going on with you. You know, maybe you'll have to let some of the war stories that you can't share or the or the personalities that are challenging that you can't really vibe about with anybody on set. Maybe you got to talk to your wife or your sister, or your girlfriend, or your homies, but you got to have an outlet for it because it can be very stressful. The guiding principles for production. As far as the psychology, what you want now takes a backseat to what you can get. And the technique for the director during production is you get what you can get by 
having all the answers, remaining calm, encouraging collaboration, which is bingo, a return to the demands on directors. All of these things flow through. Now, stage four, post-production. It's not as bad as you thought. You made a movie, maybe not the movie you thought you'd make, but something is there. The demands of production are gone, and while you can't create something that you didn't capture, you have the time and tools to protect your ideas. During post-production, you will build upon your development strategy, enhancing it with the elements that are now available to you. That includes sound effects, music, original score, color correction, ADR, and if you got money like that, reshoots. I have a quote here from, Fra from Francis Ford Coppola, where he says, the essence of cinema is editing. It's the combination of what can be extraordinary images of people during emotional moments or images in a general sense put together in a kind of alchemy. It is amazing what you can do. That's the end of the quote, now I'm talking. It's amazing what you can do by repositioning shots or putting a scene in a different place in the narrative or lifting a scene overall. All of this has uh, the sum effect of giving you a, a new opportunity to sculpt the story and cash in on what you've been trying to tell since the beginning of your outline and your script. The demands on directors pop up again. Clearly, I was making a point in this presentation of the importance of these three things, so I will, for our purposes, read it again as well. Those demands on directors are having all the answers because all creative decisions will flow through you, remaining calm despite the fact that you may not be calm, Filmmaking is about controlled exploration and command of the material. And then lastly, encouraging collaboration. Your crew is better at their jobs than you could ever be. You want them to perform as you would if you could. Stage five, exhibition, distribution. And just as a side note, I'm going to bring an editor on and we'll talk about that stage four, you know, post-production more at length and more specifically with an editor to kind of get deeper into that craft. But here for uh, stage five, exhibition and distribution, applause. Whether it's a traditional release, a DVD premiere, self-distribution through new media channels or whatever, you are a filmmaker and now you will tell everyone just how much fun you had during this torturous process. During this stage of exhibition and distribution, you will deliver 1 million sound bites answering, what's your film about? How will you do that? You'll call upon the excitement you had when you first wrote the script, outlined the treatment, or signed on to direct. You'll think about how these interviews may affect your ability to secure the next directing gig. That better excites you to go do some press or, or write a few blog posts or post on social media. But I do what I do like about this is that it is definitely a return to the work that you did in development because now you're relaying those things to everyone that you talked about. What's it about? What happens? What's the elevator pitch? Like all those things that you needed to tell cast in a in an audition or in a in a in a coffee meeting, all the things that you had to say to your crew in meetings, you're going back to those things. Like you're getting back to the 30,000 foot view of the film after having been directly like in the middle of the of the concrete with the jackhammer building the, the skyscraper. Now you're back up high looking at it from above. And so it's a bit of a shift going from the micro to the macro, but it's fun because now you see that this thing that you put all this work into has remained on track because of you and the way that you've steward, you've steered or have been the steward of this, of this project. After that slide, I have some recommended readings. These are from 2011, so let's see how they hold up. Pete Chapman's recommended readings. I have Film Industry Trades and Resources, Daily Variety, Hollywood Reporter, Screen International, IMDb Pro. Clearly, I was not up on Deadline, or maybe Deadline did not exist in 2011. I'm not sure, but add Deadline. You need to check that every day so you see what the markets are doing and what kind of dumb shit people are saying in the comments because that that that's another window into the world. Then, creative, technical, how-to, and inspirational 
books. I've got Story by Robert McKee, Never Eat Alone by Keith Ferrazzi, Making Movies by Sidney Lumet, A Cut Above, 50 Film Directors Talk About Their Craft by Michael Singer, it looks like. I have A Killer Life by Christine Vachon. I have Anthony Q. Artis's Shut Up and Shoot Documentary Guide. I have The Independent Film Producer's Survival Guide by Erickson, Halloran, and Tolchin. I have Chris Gore's Ultimate Film Festival Survival Guide. Film Budgeting by Ralph Singleton. Film Scheduling by Ralph Singleton. And Good in a Room by Stephanie Palmer. Now, the final slide in this presentation about the psychology and technique of directing is, who will you be? Hopefully this offered a little bit of a different vantage point from which to view the job of the director. There's how you view yourself. There's the five stages that you navigate, again, particularly with feature films, as far as this was crafted in 2011, but it does apply overwhelmingly to TV direction and work for hire. You just have to maybe pivot a little bit and how you consider it. But who will you be is totally up to you. It's all in your hands. And I've got an empty director's chair on this slide. And thinking back on the time when I did this, this was a time where, you know, I had made premium in 2005 after six years of grind, you know, I had made the 761st doc in 08. I had won Tribeca All Access in 08. I was working administrative job, teaching at NYU, building and running a production company. And I was really trying to fucking figure it out, y'all. Like I was trying to figure out how to get to some semblance of where I am now. And I'm really happy to, to say, and I'm really happy to look at this and kind of see that this blueprint has been the guide. It's been the compass. It's also reaffirming in consideration of my upcoming book. I just got a, a layout example from Michael Weesey Productions, who's my publisher. And it's just really interesting to kind of see everything here from 2011 is fundamentally what I'm still talking about in this book. So, you know, look, I don't, I, I don't want to be prescriptive. I think that the industry is a challenging one. I think that it is a scary one. I think that we also make it more scary than it might need to be because of our own fears. But I will say that I don't believe in movie magic. I believe in movie process. When I did the face replacement for Silicon Valley, like I mentioned at the top of this episode, I had never done that before. So I just listened and watched and reached out to people who could tell me what to avoid and what to strive for. As I've gotten in more and more rooms, I've said this often, maybe not on the podcast. I don't know because I talk a lot, but I've yet to meet any geniuses. I've met very hard workers. I've met people who understand their lane, who work hard at their craft and know how to harness their abilities with frequency and with speed. That's mostly what the industry is built upon. And then over time, because they are that efficient and creative still at what they do, they become great. They'll do that genius project at some point down the line because they've mastered the craft. So don't put the good, you know, don't put the perfect ahead of the good. You know, sometimes we just have to we have to release in beta and get better. And so my hope in this, I guess, craft episode, which was a bit of a last minute Hail Mary because I had the computer issues I mentioned at the top, I hope that it's empowering and I hope that it inspires you to maybe feel some affirmation that you're on the right path. Maybe there'll be a couple things to add to your toolkit that can be the difference between, you know, this journey taking you from 2021 to 2031. You know, as I said, this was a 10 year old presentation, but just know, you know, the universe is out here. We wanna see more projects. As always, stay safe, spread love and keep creating. 
And next week, episode 28 is around the corner. I don't know what it's going to be or who it's going to be, but I'm on it. Maybe it'll be that editor or maybe it'll be an actor or maybe someone else. But I'll holla at y'all. We're out. Episode 27. Let's shoot with Pete Chapman. What's up, people? This is Pete Chapman. Follow me on Instagram and on Twitter via at Pete Chapman. Follow the pod on Facebook on our Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman official page and hit up our mailbag with questions, suggestions, or hey, donations if you're feeling like it via Let's Shoot with Pete Chapman at gmail.com. And just in case you need to know how to spell it, that's Pete with the last name C-H-A-T-M-O-N.